Thank you, Institute of Cultural Diplomacy and its director, Mr. Mark Donfried, for this invitation. Good afternoon, Your Excellencies, distinguished speakers, friends, and ladies and gentlemen. May I, at the outset, wish all the women present today, I know it's a bit late, two days late, but still, a happy Women's International Day, which was on the 8th of March. Um, was on the same day that Malaysians were rudely awakened by the shocking news of the Malaysian Airlines, which has gone still missing, still all efforts, and many countries have come in to offer assistance to locate, so we are actually facing a very bizarre mystery at the moment and hoping for some and praying for some answers. Anyway, um, in this uh, aspect of women's development in Malaysia, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is really an honor for me to be here today and uh, to be among all the distinguished speakers, especially that we had a very distinguished panel this morning and more to come in the afternoon, to share my views and opinion of a very special issue which is very close to my heart always, not only as an ambassador of Malaysia, but as a woman and also as a mother. The United Nations has rightly chosen the theme for this year's celebration as equality for women in progress for all, which sums up the important role of women at all levels. In Malaysia, the ministry, we have a ministry responsible for women's development and which, was, uh, which had launched uh, the celebration on the 7th of March and a series of activities have been outlined to commensurate this significant event. In this time frame that I'm given here, I will discuss in brief the current situation in Malaysia from the perspective of institutional and legal frameworks in the promotion of equality and development among Malaysian women. Then I'll also st uh, talk a little bit on the Malaysian government, what the Malaysian government has done and what we have received, achieved thus far. Of a particular importance is the role of uh, Sharia law, as you all know that Malaysia is an Islamic country, and how it is practiced alongside with our civil law in protecting women's rights. Finally, I'll also talk about the future challenges as our South African colleague has also looking at way forward and opportunities for Malaysian women and the government as to work towards our developed nation status, since Malaysia is um, going towards, in a very, very aggressive way, transforming all its policies, transforming economic, political, and um, uh, global, a global transformation program to achieve developed status in 2020. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, women in Malaysia have made significant progress in almost all areas since our independence in 1957. Their achievements have no doubt been facilitated by inclusive policies and plan of action developed by the government of Malaysia in relation to our social and international obligations. Integration of women develop, women's development in national agenda is incorporated in the 1989 National Policy on Women and the 1997 Plan of Action for the Advancement of Women. The responsibility to promote women's participation in national development agenda lies in the Ministry of Women, Family and Community Development. The ministry was established in, uh, 19, in 2011 in pursuant to the Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing in 1995. Under the legal framework, the Federal Constitution of Malaysia is the supreme law of Malaysia which guarantees the equality of women and men through the constitutional amendments made on the 2nd of August, 2011. This amendment sets the basis for non-discrimination based on gender. Malaysia operates a dual legal system based on both civil law and Sharia. The competent body to decide on Sharia law matters under the Malaysian constitution is the Sharia court which referred to inter alia as the Islamic law and personal and family law of persons professing the religion of Islam. For non-Muslims, however, the same matters will fall within the federal list and will be administered by the civil courts. The result of this constitutional position is that there exists in Malaysia two parallel systems, the two sets of laws in relation to the same matters. 
Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Malaysia acceded to, acceded to the United Nations CEDAW on the 20th, on the 5th of July 1995. It is our commitment to realizing women's rights as human rights. To achieve this, ch changes in the legal and institutional frameworks have been made to protect, preserve and safeguard the rights and improve the status of women in all areas. In line with the amendment to Article 8.2 of the Malaysian Constitution, certain existing laws were reviewed to ensure the adherence to the principle of non-discrimination in gender equality. The review of the existing laws includes amendments to the Penal Code in 2006 increase, to increase the penalties for offences relating to rape and incest. Criminal Procedure Code in 2007 on proper search procedures of a person. Employment Amendment Act in 2012 on handling complaints of sexual harassments at workplace. Domestic Violence Amendment Act in 2012 on the expansion of definition of domestic violence and amendments to Islamic family law enactments. To address the issue of trafficking and exploitation of women, Malaysia has introduced the Anti-Trafficking in Persons Act 2007, which came into force on the 28th of February 2008. Malaysia is a party to the TIP protocol, which came into effect for Malaysia on 28th of March 2009. Further amendments were made to the ATIP, which is the Anti-Trafficking in Persons Act, uh, in 2007, in, in 2010, to incorporate several provisions on smuggling of migrant offences and other smuggling of migrants related and ancillary offences. The Act is now cited as the Anti-Trafficking in Persons and Anti-Smuggling of Migrants Act 2007. So we have all the acts in place. So let's see whether we implement them. The Department of Women's Development under the Ministry of Women, Family and Community Development has embarked on various programs to equip women with necessary skills. Among others, their programs include single mother's skills, incubator programs to train them with entrepreneurship skills, to increase the number of skilled and semi-skilled women in Malaysia, the Women Entrepreneurship Incubator Program was introduced. Another successful program is the One Azam Program, which aims to help Malaysians from low-income households, especially women, to generate more income to support their families through in four areas of job replacement, business, agriculture, and services. As of 31st December 2012, about 100,000 participants enrolled in the project of which about 65% participants were women. As a state party to CEDAW, the government is committed to take appropriate measures to ensure that women and men enjoy entirely the right to work and employment. The main challenge faced by the government lies in the increasing of participation of women in the labour force. Even though the female labour force participation rate has increased, from 46.9% to 47.9% for the periods of 2001 to 2011, it is still considered low. In order to fully utilize the resources and potential of women in employment, the government has set a target to increase the participation of women in the labor force to 55% in 2015, as stated in our 10th Malaysian Plan 2011 to 2015. With the, regard, with the government policies as well as their determination, women in Malaysia have achieved significant milestones in areas such as foreign service, cabinet, parliamentary, judiciary, banking and securities to name a few. Since the establishment of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, more than 30% of women have attained the level of ambassadorial positions, including the late uh, Tan Sri P.G. Lim being the first woman ambassador. To date, Malaysia has more than 40 foreign service officers at various missions as at the ambassador level or deputy heads of missions level who are women. Accomplishments by Malaysian women are also evident in the banking with the appointment of Tan Sri Dr. Zeti Aziz as the Central Bank Governor of Malaysia. Her achievements have been well recognized internationally the Global Finance magazine named her as one of the world's best central bank chief 
in 2013. Aren't we all very good chiefs women? She was again accorded grade A among the heads of central banks. Then we have also Datu Mazlan Osman, who is a lady, although women also carry the title of Datu in many cases, who is uh, our first astrophysicist and former director of the United Nations office in our outer space affairs in Vienna. She headed the Malaysian National Space Agency, ANCASA, in July 2002 for five years, where her work led to the launch of the first Malaysian astronaut. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as I've mentioned earlier, Malaysia operates a dual legal system, both civil and Sharia law. It takes a proper understanding of the sources of the Sharia to realize that they do not discriminate against women. The sources of the Sharia are divided into two classifications, the primary sources, which consist of the Quran and the Sunnah, and the secondary or dependent sources, which are not sources per se, but are rather means for discovering the law. The latter are primarily ijma or consensus on Islamic law. A ruling of fiqh is derived from the primary sources of the Sharia or in other words, derived from the Quran and Sunnah in conformity with body of principles and methods collectively known as the Usul al-Fiqh. A rule of fiqh is not being originated outside the general scope of its authoritative sources on grounds, for example, rationality alone. This is the basis that Aik is not an independent source of law in Islam. Usul Aik Fiq is thus founded in divine ordinances and acknowledgement of God's authority over the conduct of men. Although a degree of flexibility in Usul Aik Fiq permits necessary modifications in the application of the Sharia to accommodate social changes, the primary sources of Sharia can neither be abrogated nor subject to limitations of time and circumstances. Hence, the primary sources of Sharia are permanent in character. Equality remains the overriding principle and norm of the Sharia in gender-related matters. However, the parameters of equality between men and women, particularly in the fields of marriage and family relations, are determined by reference to the norms of the Quran and Sunnah. These are inextricably linked to the notion of human duties and responsibilities of the individual. And as an illustration under the Sharia, a woman requires consent of her wali, the guardian, before she can enter into a marriage, but the same requirement is not applicable to a man. The requirement of the consent by a wali, as mentioned, is not discriminatory against women, but based on the distinction between men and women under the Sharia in terms of their responsibility and role. The status is not based on the idea of inferiority or superiority of men or women, but one of duty and responsibility rather than one of authority. As personal and family law of Muslims in Malaysia is a matter under the jurisdiction of the states, each of the 13 states in Malaysia is able to enact its own set of laws governing the personal and family law of Muslims in that state. Each state has its own enactment that codifies the Sharia, determined from the various sources of the Sharia by those trained in the Sharia over matters relating to personal and family law governing Muslims. Although these state enactments are similar to content, there are differences between them in terms of certain matters, including administrative procedures. A distinction must be drawn between procedure which can be changed and the Sharia, which if based on the Quran, cannot be amended. Hence, reforms relating to the personal and family law of Muslims in Malaysia were introduced within the general framework of Siyasa, or Sharia-oriented policy, which encouraged the adoption of judicial measures which secured benefit for the individual and were not contrary to the Sharia. This is the mechanism that how Islamic law is practiced in Malaysia under the Sharia law. And by the Sharia courts, we have separate courts too hear those cases. Addressing the polarity between men, polarity between men and women is not an easy feat. According to a UNICEF report, future challenges ad include addressing the continued poverty among female-headed households, combating violence against women, raising the effectiveness of gender mainstreaming strategies, reducing women's risk of contracting HIV, removing altitudinal challenges that impact capacity building and raising the level of women's participation in the labor force, business, politics, and government. 
To this end, the government continues to play a crucial and a supportive role in achieving greater gender equality in the country by providing a healthy environment for the advancement of women at both national and international arenas. The Ministry for Women, Family and Community Development has had its budget comes to question of money as well, like what the foreign minister was saying this morning. The budget increased from 1.8 million, which is 0.5 USD in 2001, to USD 674.7 million in 2014. So we had a good, uh, good increase in the budget. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, to sum up my lecture, it is evident that international law has a pivotal role in supporting and protecting women's rights globally. In Malaysia, CEDAW has provided an impetus for the government to enhance the status of women in the country with different initiatives and programs. I outlined earlier, such as equipping, with, equipping women with entrepreneurial skills, promotion, promoting the inclusion of more women in labor force, the inclusion of women in decision-making positions and public life, as well as legislation against human trafficking. For Malaysia, the dual legal system and Sharia law create particular conditions for the application of international conventions. As I explained earlier, under the Sharia law, men and women have their own specific roles and responsibilities which are not considered to be, to constitute inequality. In this respect, understanding and mediating the particularities of the Sharia law is key, also in the wider context of the Islamic world, in the promotion of women's rights under international law. I would like to say, uh, end my uh, speech today with a quote from the late Prime Minister of Britain, not Malaysia, unfortunately. We, do, we haven't had a woman Prime Minister as yet. Margaret Thatcher, this is what she said, quote, if you want something said, ask a man. If you want something done, ask a woman. Thank you very much.